everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Ask Anything brought to you by Mosher Consulting. I'm Angel Leon, your host and Mosher's Director of Personnel. We're thrilled to have you with us today. This episode is all about UX design, and I've got two of our top consultants here to dive into the topic, Shannon Call and Anwar Eaton. Let's learn a little bit about them. Shannon's excitement for user experience comes from her relentless drive to improve products that don't function smoothly, constantly assessing which adjustments could enhance a product's functionality and user engagement. Her creative approach, no matter the medium, is to create an enjoyable experience and to ultimately be an advocate for the end user. With over 10 years of experience in the industry, she has worked with international clients such as Cigna, Bayer Corp Science, and Eli Lilly. Anwar is passionate about UX and aims to create user-friendly products for everyone. He has a master's degree in human-computer interaction and over eight years of experience in UX, having worked for companies such as Eli Lilly, Liberty Mutual, and the Health and Human Services Department. In addition to his dedication to creating accessible products, he shares his knowledge with the next generation of UX designers through his lecturing experiences at IUPUI. Let's welcome our guests, Shannon Call and Anwar Eden. How are you? Welcome to Ask Anything. Good. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. And uh, I, as someone who I love the user experience of things, I mean, you guys you guys are at the forefront of creating that wonderful experience that we as users do when we are touching a product or, you know, whether it's software on your phone or just a website itself. So I'm generally, I can, cannot wait to speak about this because it's it's something that I really enjoy seeing what you guys created the background and then how it looks like at the forefront for everybody else. So welcome. We're, we're very happy that you guys are with us today. So let's start with the basics. What is UX design and why is it important in today's digital landscape? So UX is basically a good way to think about it is it's like everything that you touch and see that is the user experience. So it could be a piece of software that you use. It could be the way that your computer functions. It could be the way that technically like the aircraft flies, like all of those like controls, how does that get laid out? All that kind of stuff. Our niche is more like web and software, but you do see people like in human computer interaction, which is like that bigger umbrella term kind of go into more stuff. But specifically like what we do is we really wanna make sure that the users who are using the product understand it without having to be trained on it, because the worst thing that can happen is you get into a software, you have to take a five hour training, and then you don't understand any of it still because you don't have enough interactions. So as you see the progression of technology over the years, you see more stuff kind of become commonplace where it's like those three lines in a menu system means that that is the menu. That's a hamburger menu. You see stuff moving away from just like, oh, a camera icon means it's a camera and you start seeing more stylized stuff. If you look at like iOS back in the day to now where it's like, that skeuomorphism where it's like, oh, back in the day, it had to look legitimately like a camera for people to understand yeah. it was a camera. And now people can kind of say, oh, I understand that connection. So what we try to do is we try to make that transition seamless. So we're trying to stay with those current trends. We're trying to make sure that we understand what people are seeing, what people are used to, making sure that we match that and testing it with users. So it's like saying, hey, let's try this out. Does this pass what you guys expect? Does this fail? How can we meet in that middle how can we add accelerators so those users can use it faster who do understand it, but not make it so advanced that it's like, yeah, you're gonna have to take a two-day training on this or you're never gonna understand it. So we try to balance out all those. I know that was a little bit all over the place, but it's really trying to understand where the users are, meeting them there and not making them meet us where we're at. And I just want to throw in UX stands for user experience. People don't always know that either, but good to know. Yeah, and I, and I can certainly relate to the example you were using and more about iOS and what it looked like, you know, 10 years or so ago, or probably a little bit older. I mean, I can still remember the first iPhone when it came out and when Steve Jobs held it in his hand and the old look of the apps back then versus what they look like now. I mean, a lot has changed, even though when you really look at the nature of each app and what they look like back then, really not a lot has changed, but just the design itself, like you were saying, that outer shell, basically that the app button that you press has changed a lot. And then once you go to the app, obviously a lot of the user experience has changed, but that's, that's a really good example of what you guys do and how it translates over the years. So Let's talk about business case for UX design. Why do businesses need consulting on UX design? I think one big point is an increase 
in revenue potentially, as well as um, reduce costs overall. Usually when we can step in and do some research and figure out what the users really need for their processes, you can sort of streamline the design process as well. So that won't last as long as well as development time you can make it faster to market as well. It also can help your brand reputation as well. If you, if the users are struggling, they might not have the best perception of your product or your company. So it can really help out in that regard as well. When you look at like that last point of brand reputation, people getting onboarded to a product, we kind of serve in this niche where it's like, we have technically kind of a captive audience um, where it's like, you know, they are your peers. They're people who have to like use the software you're developing. But even with that captive audience, what we've found is you'll get an audience of people. So it might be your CTO who's like bringing on this product. He's the one that brought us in, but then you might have the CFO on the other end where he's looking at purely the revenue of it. And kind of what you get with that is if you have a bunch of people and you can't make that business case at that C-level suite, or even, you know, down the line of like, Hey, you know, we have this group of people who don't want to use the software. They're adamantly against it. Why are we spending a ton of money on building it out? So what we try to do is like, we make those use cases for them and, you know, they might come to us with some, but really making those success stories of saying, Hey, you know, as Shannon said, more people are using the app. It's easy to use. We're trying to make sure that we make those cases early. So by doing user testing, user studies, stuff like that, we're not going to find that in the development process where they are having like 10 developers, five developers. It might be us and um, the PO working together with the client to say, Hey, Let's make sure that we get really what you need before we start, you know, adding on more people to the team. So it's kind of that upfront cost, being able to explain it at that higher level. We really try to bridge that gap early as we can so that when you're down the line, you're not making a ton of fixes. You're not trying to make changes. Inevitably, software is changing, but we don't want to make it planned. We want to make those updates that we want to make. We want to make sure that we can come in with like the smallest package possible, prove the value, and then expand later on, not keep changing stuff because we didn't know what we wanted. And I have a real life example, if it's helpful, that kind of came up a few weeks ago. We're redesigning an application for a client and we weren't able to get exactly one-on-one -on -one time with the users, but we were able to send out a survey and figure out which features they were actually using, what changes they'd like to see made, what are sort of the pain points for them and their day-to-day -day work. And so the results of that survey are going to help inform like what we work on next and what that design will look like and what we can take out that wasn't really necessary for them, you know, to complete that work. So it was really helpful in that circumstance. I always find that stuff too interesting because I know in that case, like in a lot of cases, you have people who might've been at a company for the past like eight years. And during that eight years, they could have started as like a sales rep, for example. And now they're like the sales manager and they're trying to build the software. And they're the ones that, you know, brought in some of the other people. They're the one that brought in us. And they're like, I know all of this. I know what the problems are, but they haven't been a sales rep for the past five years. So I think like to Shannon's point about doing a survey and talking to people, that's what we try to do is like bridge that gap and like say, okay, you know, we understand what you're saying. We want to talk to you. But at the end of the day, you know, you might've not been a sales rep a couple of years ago. So let's go talk to them, understand what they're doing today. And, you know, you might've changed some of the processes too throughout that time. So let's go in and talk to them. Even in some of those cases where you do want to be at the forefront because you do work for this company, you're trying to show that expertise. I think we always try to strike a good balance of, hey, you know, we can also take what you want to do right now, mock up a design. Um, it might take us like, Long term, let's say it's a giant system, it takes us a month to do what they want. That's still less time than a development team would take. And we can take that to those users, get them to walk through it, run through the product and make changes pretty quickly versus what we would have to do if we just like took them at their word. We didn't proof concept it with um, a clickable design and, you know, we just developed it because that gap of just like two or three years, because someone used to be in that role, stuff can change a lot, you know? We look at AI and all that kind of stuff today of just like all that new features. It's interesting to see. I have a question about say, the user testing and maybe even process because in a previous life, I worked at a software company and we had a couple of different user testing uh, as, through development surveys, interviews with users like you were talking about, uh, and then even moving into user observation or back then we would give, it would be like a paper representation. Like it was a printout of the screen. So there's no actual programming, kind of move the process along a little bit to kind of see how intuitive 
what the next step or what you need to push or buttons, choices that are going to be made, how they're making those decisions and moving through the software. That's something that's still done, I assume, but where in process, like how early is that introduced? And do you still use paper or is it like screens now? I've used paper prototypes in the past, especially my first UX role, um, but I haven't at Mosier yet, but it is a good way to get some ideas, especially if you're in like a workshop with some of the users and you can just quickly kind of take down ideas. That's her being nice and not trying to call you old, Brian. <laughs> no. <laughs> We've been called worse before. <laughs> They'll have to speak up. But the gramophone speaker I'm using is loud. Yeah. <laughs> Piggyback on that process question that Brian just had. So let's say everything is hunky dory, right? And you guys are coming in. And what does the process look like for you guys in a perfect scenario? Let's let's throw out the wrenches. We're not going to throw any wrenches at you. But if you had a perfect scenario that you you could say, oh, if this happened from A to Z, this would be the perfect thing. What would you describe that as? I think for me personally, I can go real quickly, maybe just having a client that really respects the user's feedback and is willing to make those changes to make their jobs a little easier. I've mostly just worked on internal apps for um, like employee applications. So I don't have quite as much experience with like a I don't know, like a customer facing app, so to speak. But I think just really taking into that feedback and being open to changes is what I get most excited about. It makes the job a little easier and seamless. I think the key thing probably there is like just being a partner with them. We are consultants at the end of the day, but to us, like our success is their success. So it's like, you look at that same example that I gave where it's like, you know, someone's developed through a company, you know, now they're a sales rep or, you know, they're the high end of the company. We want to make them successful to every client. We always say we're local. We might not be, but, you know, just depending on where they're at, we do want to be a partner with them. We want to help them out. We'll work with them through everything. And a part of that's just like talking to users, understanding what their company needs, understanding what they need, because there's always two sides to the product where it's like, the business case of it, what does the right. company want, you know, ROI, et cetera. And then there's the user end of just saying, we don't want to take five hours doing this. You know, we want this product to be something that we can glance through. So I think that partnership is really the core of what we look for when we like look at the top end of something. We sometimes talk about like the double diamond process. So it's like something like that might be, you know, starting off at the basics of looking at just understanding the product, understanding what they need, building it out, refining, and kind of going through that process. So doing user testing, doing the designs, exploring some of those fringe concepts that they might want, because those fringes might lead to a better idea. And then saying, what is a workable chunk is kind of how we try to go through everything, but it's really working with them, understanding what they need and making sure that's good. Follow-up question to that. How nervous would encountering a wrenchless, completely smooth development make yeah. you? I would be like, I'm clearly missing something. What is good? Like, I would, I would be absolutely uh, like just tied in knots going, I've missed something. Sorry. <laughs> I think it make both of us really nervous. I feel like every time that we have that, where it's like, everything's going too well, like we understand it too easily. Like, what are we missing here? Uh, you know, it just happens easily. <laughs> like, you know, you don't expect stuff to go that easily. Everything should be a little hard. Find something at the 11th hour or something. That you never uncovered so and yeah, this is great i don't trust great yeah <laughs> what is going on so out of everything you describe you both describe what would you say would be the key components to what you guys finally end up doing so when you're gathering all the data like what are the things that you look at anwar for example and you shannon like what are the things that are your aha to you i think it's just the ease of a user being able to go through a product, like showing them a clickable prototype in Figma and them being able to like say, oh, I understand where to go. You know, there's times that we try to have a big enough user pool and we can sit someone down in front of the computer and like say, hey, this is a product. Here's your task. Try to complete it. No other instructions other than that. And if they're able to navigate through the system, find what they need, and it's, you know, meeting that business goal. I feel like that's our favorite moment. That's our, you know, aha moments is we understood it enough 
that we were able to translate those needs into a design that someone else can use without any instructions from us. That's just totally intuitive. Like that's the goal. And I think um, also maybe like decreasing the amount of time it might take for each task that they were doing before, like mm. streamlining that process is really like rewarding and even like support costs too. Like if yeah. you can minimize those, like that's super important as well. And it makes it less stressful on everyone. So I think all those are markers of a good job, I think. Well, that segues nicely into my next question, return of investment, because Anwar mentioned it a little while ago. So can you share with us a possible return on investment on UX design? How could a business measure this? And can you share some examples of this? I think most of the studies, like when you're looking at them, they kind of rate it as like, you can reduce development time around 50% when you are bringing in a UX designer. Um, so what that includes is really like a lot of that rework that we talked about. So it's like understanding that product early enough that we're not going back and like building in buffers to basically say, oh, you know, we're going to have to figure out rework. We can basically say, hey, this should be right the first time. And you're also looking at about a 33% of like return on investment just in development time prioritizing the task. So being able to bring stuff together quicker, easier to understand, all of those are kind of, I feel like the big ones. And I think the other one when you're looking at it is it's like when we look at the way that Mosier kind of establishes the dev team, it's like one UX designer per like five or 10 developers. So when we're looking at building a product, we're one fifth to one tenth the budget of the development team and we're able to work ahead of them to basically say, hey, this is what you guys are getting. Are you guys sure you guys want that before they're even starting up work? And usually we bring in a PO as well. So they're writing stories, being able to do some stuff that really by the numbers helps alleviate some time. We can help answer questions, um, help make sure that we're narrowed in on scope before we really start. How is that, Shannon? Do you want to add anything? <laughs> No, I kind of touched on it a little bit before, but no, I think that makes sense. And I have to say that with what you said before, Shannon, on return of investment, I think that makes a great deal of sense. I can speak for, as you were mentioning, the internal apps that we have here and some of the work that has been done on them recently has definitely cut down the time that my team takes to do some of their tasking. So that I don't view that as, as a money value return of investment. I see it as a time value return of investment. And to us, it really means a lot to have a lot more time to do other things than to administratively go about taking care of this app or, or that website, et cetera. So that to me means a whole lot more than, than you guys uh, know. So thank you uh, oh, thank for you. the work that you guys have put together for us. I do want to add on to that. I feel like it's interesting, just like your point of like, I feel like separating the value of money and like working in software mm -hmm. might be like a misnomer, basically, because yeah. it's like, if you're spending all of that time dealing with the app, trying to do stuff in there, you have other stuff that you might need to do that same day. And it's like, by reducing the time within the Mojo applications that we've developed, you guys are not having to like add on headcount to like do the same amount of work you guys are now spending less time here. So it does have increased value outside of like development time and stuff like that by like yes. time on task and all that. Not in the bad way of reducing headcount, but like in the, right. um, reducing frustration maybe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that, that's a great way of putting it. It's interesting because as I said, I value the time, the less time that it takes us now to do some of these tasks much more. And, and again, I'm not, I'm strictly talking about time. I know that value money it means it that's what drives everything but for for us internally when we're looking at how much time we're spending on a certain task the value that i see in cutting down that time and moving forward and really just looking at other things that we probably wouldn't be looking at as quickly as we could because of those changes it means the world to us so no i i agree it's that return of investment to me is more valuable than probably the money part. But again, we're not here sitting with CFOs thinking, hey, I need you guys to, to make sure that this returns X times, you know, our value in money than time. So yeah, um, sorry, that's my take. Uh, yeah, you're anyway. good. So let's talk about what good UX design look like. What does it look like? What sets it apart? 
I think there's like a misconception maybe that the most beautifully designed like interface is the best thing but in reality it could be the most simple interface it's very easy to understand and work through that is the winner in the end so I always try to keep that in mind you want to make it efficient easy to understand accessible to different people with different abilities like it's just important to keep all those things in mind like I think to that point where it's like you think of you know, the most beautifully designed thing, you might say like, oh, I really want this like tone of yellow on my site. I might want this tone of like, let's say a darkish blue. But then what you run into is like, oh, that might not be an accessible product. And that's where it's like, you have to kind of take a lot of stuff into account with UX design because you want it to be simple and you want it to be usable. At the end of the day, graphic design is not my strong suit. We do have people who are, you know, really great at graphic design on the team. That's not really what we do. Some of us can but that's not what we do. What we try to do is back to that point of like, when you sit down on the computer, no matter who you are. So if you have visual impairment, you have like an auditory impairment, cognitive, et cetera, et cetera. You're able to just get on the computer and use it, which sounds very simple, but it's like, when you think of colors, you think of WCAG or section 508, when you're looking at those, there's like a lot of other stuff that kind of has to go into it to say, you know, I get onto my screen reader and it's reading it back to me correctly. I have bad contrast vision. So can I actually read this correctly? Because it's not contrasting enough because I think it's like one in five males are colorblind. So when you look at that stat, it's like, if you're at a tech company, you're going to have a decent amount of people who might have Mm -hmm. a visual impairment just on that alone. Like Shannon said, it goes beyond the design. It goes to like the accessibility. It goes to just not having to spend a week on training, (laughs) Um, you know. (laughs) I feel like that's always like the worst thing is like you roll out like a new software or something and it's like, oh, we need to show people where to click on each of these buttons just to use it. And it's like, you don't want to, like you want people just to say, hey, log in here and use it. So that's, that's our goal. And I think after the products released too, another facet of like good UX design is to continually test and get feedback and make those improvements because it's not always going to be perfect from the get-go. It's just impossible. There's so many things that you can't know until it's sort of live. So I just think being open to changing and taking in that feedback is super important as well. Coming hot off the heels of an Apple release. <laughs> like there's a reason why we're on iOS 18. It's not because it was perfect the first time, you know? So you look at that. I mean, as a business, it's like your needs change, your users' needs change. So there is a need for constant evolution with technology. You know, you look at a house from like the 1950s that people are like, oh, it was built super soundly. But then you look inside and people renovate it. closets. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, people's needs change. So it's like to that point, you want to make sure you're constantly evolving and everything. Yeah. And I, and I like your note about it's not all about how everything looks and how the colors, et cetera, and all those things. It's a user experience. You want that person to feel comfortable with the software from the second they grab their mouse and they're clicking through. It it shouldn't be that hard. But like you said, sometimes people focus on that colors and, and really on the aesthetics of the page instead of focusing on that user experience on if I'm going to click this, is it going to do this? And then it's going to take me to the different places that I need to go, or is it going to bring me the information I need from the main menu, from that hamburger menu, as you mentioned? So all those things, that's what user experience is about. Before we go, we kind of touched a little bit about AI earlier and won't mention it, but let's turn to AI because why not? That's taking over every aspect of our profession, honestly. So how is AI used in the context of US, UX design? Any differences in how UX design is done with AI versus how it was done prior to this AI boom? Um, We did use some AI features that were newer in Figma for, we did a workshop with one of our groups to sort of get feedback about, I'm just being big because I don't know how much I can say, but we did sort of a sticky note like workshop. And so we then took those notes and put them into Figma And it was able to organize them. We call that affinity mapping. We'd usually do that by hand, like on a whiteboard. We were just kind of trying to see the themes it came up with. And it was actually pretty on the nose. Like, I felt like it functioned really well. And that can take like a day or two or more, like to usually process, depending on how many sticky notes you ended up with or like feedback. In that case, it was really helpful. I'm thinking a couple of weeks ago in Maze, it's another platform we use for user research. We sent out a survey 
we got about 36 responses back and it was tagging them based on like, is this a positive comment? Is it a neutral or negative comment? A lot of them were wrong, which I was surprised about. So we had to manually like change those and we were just kind of testing it because we'd never used that feature before and wanted to see how it worked. But then another thing it did, it also grouped them into themes similar to affinity mapping. And some of the themes were really good, but some of them like were not realistic. They didn't make sense in terms of like the client we were testing. It just was like, it needed a lot of handholding. So I think it almost took a little bit longer to get through some of it than normal. I'm sure it's going to improve with time, but we were just kind of testing out that feature. But one of the things it did do, which was really cool, you'd have like a general question, you'd answer it, type up a response in an open text field, and then it would generate a follow-up question based on what you typed in. And that was super helpful because that's something that we couldn't have predicted we would only be able to ask that if we were actually on site with them, like talking to them one on one. So that feature was really helpful and exciting. But those are just a couple examples of where I've kind of noticed AI in our workplace. Yeah, I think Shannon's points uh, kind of right there. Shannon, did you guys use the follow up feature in Maze? We did. Yeah, you can limit how many after like follow up questions it asks. We just did one this time, um, and only in one case was it just kind of like that doesn't really make sense. Like hopefully they weren't too confused by the follow up question, but we did, and we were able to get some good feedback that way that we wouldn't have had normally. That was like an interesting use case because it was basically like we would write one question based off their response. It would read that and then give them another question. So it allowed us to have a more open-ended format of a survey that we wouldn't be able to like follow. Cause it's like a lot of times we would have like an open-ended survey that we might send out to people. They would answer it and we're like, oh, I wish they would have told us more about this. So that's like a very interesting feature where it's like reading that, hopefully giving us a good follow-up question. That is like what we wanted to ask. But I think that's something that is a good, you know, potential segue. I think really it's just like reducing the time that we take on stuff that it's really doing well at. It's like, you know, there's still handholding. There's some shifting of terminology, but it's like, you know, you can ask AI a question of like, hey, I can't think of this question to ask the user. So you can kind of frame it up with it and just see how it responds back and maybe take that and play with it. I feel like we've also just played around with it of just like, hey, we need like a team name or something. I mean, we might do that. So I feel like there is some features that helps us reduce time on doing stuff that took us longer, some bridging of technology where it's like, hey, in the past, we'd have to like ask them, hey, can we get your email for a follow-up and email them? But it would do that in software now. So kind of runs the spectrum of usefulness to like not usefulness, I would say. I know if we do a survey again, we're probably not going to let it sort first. We might use that later on once we have done it ourselves to see like, oh, is there anything we missed that like could be interesting here? But we would definitely use like the follow-up questions. That was super interesting. And like I said, I'm sure it will get better with time. I th I feel like that's where AI sits right now. It's like in the middle of usefulness and not usefulness. So it, it definitely looks to be just at about the right stage for you guys right now, where you guys still have to do some of the manual stuff and some of the things that you guys are used to versus what it could be maybe down the line. As we were saying, is the usability going to be saving you some time in the future? We're all about to find out. So with that, Anwar, Shannon, it's a pleasure to have you with us on Ask Anything. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. This was great. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Ask Anything brought to you by Mosher Consulting. We hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation about UX design. Be sure to join us next time as we dive even deeper with our resident experts and explore what they're currently working on. Don't forget to share your ideas or topics with us on social media. In the meantime, please remember to give us a rating and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, so long, everybody. 